welcome in. It is a Wednesday edition here. T minus 24 hours until the Sweet 16. We got plenty of college basketball to go over. We do have a uh, game or two here tonight. Some of the other tournaments will uh, we'll point you in the right direction on those. But this is all about you guys here. No doubt uh, you guys are uh, sitting on the fence trying to figure out which games and which teams you should concentrate on. We're going to try to point you in that right direction here with two of the best as we welcome back in Brian Leonard in the house. BL here, a little uh, fresh tan. Looks uh, like you might have spent a day or two at the beach there, and you're not getting that in Vegas, so I know you weren't there, Brian. Uh, and Trigg back in the house. Adam Trigger, a lot of people in the chat room yesterday, Trigg, were, uh, were wanting to know if uh, all was okay, and I told him you were – uh, in upstate New York, uh, and you were uh, maybe uh, indisposed there just a bit, but it's glad to see that you're up and you are breathing. Uh, gentlemen, I've asked everybody on this week to get some of your initial thoughts on what you witnessed in the round of 64 and 32. Obviously, Brian Leonard, it was a little bit chalky there in the round of 32, but uh, outside of the I was there, was there anything? I mean, what was the biggest surprise to you here on uh, the takeaway from the first weekend? Well, the the surprise to me is the adjustments make based on watching one game that people make. Uh, there were some teams that looked really good or really bad, and the lines have gone in those directions. It's sort of like when I talk about for Monday Night Football. Uh, if the team on Monday Night Football looks really good and you want to bet them the next night, the next week, you better get them then because there's going to be a long line of people looking to bet that. Uh, so you keep in mind, these guys have played 40 games or some, some close to it. So you can't just look at what you saw. And a lot of the times when you get to these tournaments, people see a team for the first time. And so you're getting a lot of people out there thinking uh, – that these teams are a lot better than what they are, a lot worse than they are. So keep in mind, yes, uh, I would rather take a look at a team's recent game as opposed to what they did a month or two ago. But still, that's all included in your resume. And don't overreact to one or two games that are in. As long as you don't do that, you should be pretty good in this round. Yeah, well, it, it, recency bias there, uh, Trig. Did you witness any up in the uh, up in the Adirondacks there <laughs> at the at the uh, at the casino? What uh, it's a real thing, and a lot of you know, a lot of new betters. That's what they do, right? It's uh, what they last saw here, but it's something you got to try to guard against. Yeah, I mean that's kind of something that happens every year, right? Like we get a lot of you know recreational money in the market and suddenly everyone's an expert on drake yet they probably didn't watch drake play all year um and it certainly you know starts to get factored into the betting lines i guess what i learned a reminder this weekend and, and it kind of comes up every year is that these games are tough to bet like once you get to march madness the lines are super sharp for the most part uh, i really felt like that was the case this weekend when, when trying to pick games and it's only going to get more difficult right like as we go on we're down to uh, 18, not even 18, like six teams left in the NIT, um, 16 left in the NCAA tournament. So, you know, it, it's it's only going to get more difficult as as it goes. So, like, you know, if I'm looking at the Sweet 16 trying to approach this weekend, like, I, I mean, which I am, obviously, I, maybe one or two spots are, are actually going to make it to, like, be an actual play. Uh, it's it's going to be hard. You know, it, it's just otherwise, I think you're just kind of guessing like a lot of these lines are, are like spot on and the books aren't going to make, you know, mistakes like they not that they make mistakes, but like you're not going to get those nice soft lines like, like you, you know, like you are in a Patriot League game in February uh, in the Sweet 16. <laughs> so that's something I always try to like, you know, check myself with as we go through this final two weeks of the of the season. So what you're saying is that when you have a team like UConn, who's a double-digit favorite, they're a double-digit favorite for a reason, Trig, you think, with the books? I mean, they haven't been that far off. I mean, it's a lot of games. Obviously, they got some of them wrong. But, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, what we're seeing is what we're getting here, right? So I think where you're going to find line value from this point forward would be where there's a big time premium based on like the, the books sort of factoring in for like an overreaction or the, or the books anticipating a way that the betting public wants to bet. Like that's probably the only 
air, you know, only spot the rest of the way, you're going to actually find a number that's quote unquote off. It's not that it's going to be off. It's just that if you're, you know, if you're willing to like, let's say oppose UConn here with the San Diego state, you're probably getting like kind of a decent number because the books are, are setting this up for, you know, you, you to have to lay a premium with UConn. Why is that? Because anyone that did it the first weekend won and they won easily. Right. So like you have, you know, Brian was talking about what did we just see? Well, the betting public cashed against Stetson laying a boatload with UConn. They came right back and cashed against Northwestern laying, laying a ton. So those are the kind of spots where you might get a little line value that's like built in. It's not that the books are making a mistake by any means. It's that they know they can hang a bigger number and still get that same sort of handle on like a team like UConn or maybe even, you know, we, we may even see a, a playable number come about on Alabama, right? Like as, as North Carolina seems to take all the money here. So those would be the types of things I'd be looking for the round of 16 and the round of eight just to try to like create some, some value for yourself. Yeah, so, uh, bro, you've been around this game for, uh, I don't know, about a half hour or so. Uh, you've uh, you've seen a few of these here. Uh, the idea that books get it wrong on a consistent basis. Again, if I'm a double-digit favorite in a Sweet 16, probably a pretty good reason why we're a double-digit favorite. Now, anybody can beat anybody. And there were an awful lot of upsets in the round of 64. But every year, it seems like, and 64, you get your your upsets. 32, eh, maybe not as much. And then once we get to this point and on, those numbers are are tight, man. Yeah, they are tight. And uh, to touch on something that uh, uh, Trig talked about, when you get – it's not going to happen now, but once you get to the Final Four area, books have responsibilities on the futures boards. So they may have a lot of money based on one team. Um, you know, for example, out here in Las Vegas, maybe Arizona is taking a lot of money uh, because it's close and a lot of people from Arizona come to Vegas. So they've got a lot of money invested on Arizona to win the championship. You will find a little bit of value at that casino. Every casino is a little bit different. They all take uh, different amounts of money based on whatever they, they put the lines out on. If they were off on something early, the wise guys are going to hit them. So you'll be able to see good differences during the final four. But uh, so make sure you shop around. But yeah, it's one of the things I like to do is if a team has looked really good, I want to fade that team. If a team is coming off of a game where they probably should have lost, that's a scary situation for them. And I know they're going to be uh, really concentrating at practice this week. So, uh, in fact, one of the games we're going to talk about today has one of those situations, at least in my mind. All right, so we that's great stuff there. And we've got uh, some tremendous questions coming in on the uh, chat room there. Uh, those that are watching us on uh, your desktop or uh, TV, uh, we certainly appreciate you coming. I'm going to get to David's got a question. Theo's got a great question about future tickets and what to do. So some really good stuff there. We also want to dive into a couple of big game breakdowns here, but uh, those of you joining us uh, there in that chat room, uh, if you guys would hit that subscribe button or the thumbs up, we'd certainly appreciate it. And shout out to those watching on a mobile uh, on YouTube shorts and our live feed there. Seth is in the house, as is Dari. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming. Drop the questions in, and we got a few coming in on Instagram as well. So why don't we kick it off with one of the games here, and Bri, we'll start with this duke houston game uh as a big game breakdown and get some of your thoughts on this one uh to me when you have a team and again you've been seeing this a half hour but when you have a team like houston blows a double digit lead in the final two minutes four guys foul out they got to have some dude pretty much might as well have been sitting in the stands uh rather than actually trying to win the game for him and he does that will either a take a team and they got nothing left in the tank or it'll propel a team to just steamroll and vote everyone from here how do you side with what we just watched houston have to go through a couple of days rest but do you think this helps them or that game against a&m hurt them yeah i, I think it helps them uh it's a situation for me where they've proven that they're a very good team and uh you were able to get them off of a bad performance and I'm not worried about it's not like uh, you're playing again the next day. This is a team that uh, all these teams have had a few days off 
so they got time to get that out of there. But uh, Duke looked extremely impressive in the first two rounds of this tournament. A 64 to 47 win over Rouen and a 93 to 55 blowout to James Madison. But those are two of the weaker teams in the big dance, and they had problems matching up with the Blue Demons. Now Duke takes on a big step up in class against possibly the best defensive team in the nation, and that's Houston. Uh, when you take a look at what Duke has done against the teams that are still alive in this tournament, they're one and three straight up, uh, and uh, they lost at home to Arizona, 78 to 73. Duke lost twice to North Carolina, 93 to 84 and 84 to 79. They were able to split against, against NC State, which I guess is the only true dark horse that's still alive in the tournament. Uh, they won six, uh, 79 to 64 on the road, and then they lost 74 to 69 in the conference tournament. Um, and that win for NC State got them in this tournament. They, they uh, have really taken advantage of that. But Houston's allowing an effective field goal percentage of 43.9 on the season, which is just tremendous. Uh, they struggled last game, as you mentioned, 100 to 95 overtime contest win over Texas A&M. Uh, four players had foul problems in that game and fouled out. And yet after blowing the double-digit lead, they had the heart to come back and get that victory. That tells me a lot about this Houston team. That's the type of team I want to back when looking at straight, when looking at uh, what they've done in the last couple of games. Uh, in fact, if you look at the strength of schedule, we find Duke at 69, Houston at 25. So I look for the Cougars' defense to be the key here. Both teams play very good defense. I know Houston has struggled sometimes when they're playing against good defensive teams, but Duke has really struggled when stepping up against good defensive teams. So I'll, I'll take Houston here, uh, a team that I thought going into it was probably the second or third best team in the in the nation. So I'll take Houston here, laying what I think is a little bit of a cheap number here against Duke. Oh, all right. A little bit of a cheap price here with this one. Uh, that's interesting. And, you know, the Duke fans are going to be uh, they're going to be out in full force here. But let's be realistic. I mean, Trig, like who was president last time Duke was relevant? I mean, good Lord. Uh, it's been a hot minute here. Uh, and this uh, could very well be the year that it gets done. So uh, we'll see what happens, though. Houston is going to be a tough one out. I do want to get to a couple of the questions, Trig, before we get to your big game breakdown here on Marquette and NC State, which uh, I think is going to be an interesting matchup, to say the least. But let me go uh, to, I want to make sure I get David's uh, question correctly. David asks that I've got a $500 future on Arizona to win it all. It's at 12 to 1. Thoughts on hedging and how to uh, effectively hedge or does he just go to hell with it? You know, hedging's for gardeners. Nobody wants to do that, Trig. 12 to 1 in Arizona. Any advice or thoughts for David uh, who may uh, may be looking to hedge here at this point? Uh, I would say come back next week when we do this show and ask me again. Because I don't, I don't think you should hedge before the Final Four. And I definitely don't think you should hedge before Clemson. So, um yeah, it wouldn't even be a thought for me. It's not a big enough number. I mean, it. I guess it would depend on the number, but, like, I'm guessing whatever you got Arizona at it is not a big enough price to even consider it before the Final Four. Listen, you get, like, again, I, I, I wouldn't do it at any number with the position you have against Clemson here. Um, projecting out to the Elite Eight, like, yeah, that's going to be a more difficult matchup, but... I still think you just you have to ride it and hope you you win the the elite eight game, but yeah, I mean it's it's a valid question for this time next week. So like I said, like come back and ask next week because I'll have a much better opinion on what you should do. Uh, but I'm pretty strong on my position that I I would almost not hedge any national championship future unless it was something crazy like a like a hundred to one, hundred fifty to one, something like that. Uh, wouldn't hedge it before the final four. I think you can get creative. All right, once so you get I mean, to the twelve to one at this point, but maybe, not before the play. hold on to it. Yeah, at twelve one. I yep. mean, hold on to it. It might be a little bit early in the game here. How about you, Brian? What kind of advice did you have? Somebody holding a twelve to one ticket on uh, on Arizona here about hedging? Yeah, I'm in agreement with Trig on there. At least for this round, um, they they are a substantial favorite against Clemson, a team who has really overperformed a little bit. So I I wouldn't want to do it now. 
but it all depends on what your situation is. Um, if he, if five, if you know, it, it five, five to one, six thousand um, dollars is is important to you. If that's a lot of money, then you would look to hedge. If it's not, it's not going to change your bankroll very much. I would be like Trig and, and wait until the final four. Then you look at the matchups and see what happens there. But don't do it now. And um, we'll see what happens after this game. This and get down to the final eight and see what happens. But um, yeah, unless it's life changing money that you you need to get some of it back. I, I don't see uh, I don't see the situation where Clemson is going to beat beat Arizona outright. It could happen. Obviously, this is sports. But um, you're in a pretty good shape at twelve to one there. Yeah, and uh, one other one we got in there, uh, guys. Well, I'll come back to you, Theo. Uh, talking about he's got a future on Illinois to make it to the Final Four. Says if they uh, handle business against Iowa State, we'll be looking to hedge against in all likelihood. Uh, what is UConn at that particular point? I think he may be able to hedge a little bit here. I, I, I just think it. Um, Iowa State, it, I thought coming into the tournament, Iowa State had a lot of value. For one of the bigger seeds, I thought they were uh, – a team that could go pretty far, and they've proven they've gone very far. They were a very good defensive team. Uh, so I might start hedging now because, to be honest with you, I didn't think Illinois was going to make it this far. I bet against them, um, and in fact, that's my only loss in the tournament, I believe. I'm hitting is 86% in the tournament, the big dance, and one of the losses, if I believe the only loss, was against Illinois, so I could be wrong in that regard, but they've surprised me. They, they've outperformed their metrics in the tournament, we'll see if it continues. But uh, in a in a near pick'em game like that, um, I don't think they're a team that can win at all. So there's better teams out there. So I might start hedging right now. Trig, you in agreement with that one here? If, uh, Final Four ticket with Illinois, maybe uh, or let it ride and then wait until you got to take on either what San Diego State or UConn. Uh, I would need to know what like the price is on these because. I mean, if it, if this is like something that was bad like a couple weeks ago, like three or four to one. I mean, I, I again, like I don't know that I'm uh, gonna hedge before the UConn game. Basically, like it's like, I, I what's the goal here? I would need more info. Like, I, I guess it just it, I, I I need more context because you know, <laughs> typically you bet a team to make the final four, a team like Illinois, which is not. I mean, that's not like a long shot by any means, right? Like they're a top mm-hmm. four seed in their region. You're doing it at the beginning of the NCAA tournament. Like, are we really hedging in the Sweet 16? Like, what's the point of that? Like, now if you right. bet, if if this was bet way before, like in January, and you suddenly had this like great position, but now you were like a little bit unsure against like a team like Iowa State, and you knew you didn't want to get to like the UConn round, like because again, we're talking about right now, a hedge doesn't guarantee you anything, right? You you would need to still go two rounds. I mean, I don't know. It seems a little much. Again, I'm I'm really only for I'm really only for hedging when you have the book so much by the balls that you can like really gain something from it, right? Like so you've got a, like an example like like if you had NC State right now to right. like make the final four or something like that, like this huge like huge number, that's something where I might start to try to get creative and and, and figure out how to hedge. But these are like, I mean, we're talking Arizona's like borderline one of the fate top choices in their region. Illinois to make the final right. four. Like these aren't crazy things here. These aren't I don't long know why shots. we're trying to hedge them right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're, don't do it. Uh, yeah. Well, now speaking of that, by the way, uh, shout out to those uh, joining us here on uh, Instagram here. I got a great uh, question uh, coming up by Stocktonic93 regarding uh, Alabama taking on North Carolina. We're going to get that question here in just a minute. And also, I think the consensus uh, in Instagram is as well, if you hedge now, you're probably going to have to hedge more than once. So better off just letting it sit. That's a great point in there uh, um, in Instagram. And uh, again, if you have any questions, guys, drop them into the chat rooms. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, that like button if you could. We'd appreciate it. As Trig is going to break down uh, another very, uh, what could very well be a, a good game or maybe not, Trig, depending on how you're looking at this, with Marquette laying six and a half over 
the 11 seed there, NC State, which uh, I keep hearing that oh, no Cinderella's left. Well, the, they're an 11 seed. So I guess from that definition, I don't think anybody had North Carolina State in their brackets to this point here, Trig. But how does the game go? So these are the type of games that are, are difficult. It's these six, seven-point favorites when you get to the Sweet 16. Uh, I want to say Houston was one of these last year when they lost to Miami. Like the, the reason they're tough, Joe, is because now like NC State's had the entire week to prepare for this game. It's still going to be on a neutral floor. So like I have a hard time actually getting to, to the window with some of these as like best bets for that reason. But if you want to talk about maybe finding a little bit of line value, I, I do think you could make a case that Marquette you're getting a pretty good number with Marquette here, only having to lay six and a half. The reason I say that, Tyler Kolick is probably the best point guard in the country, and he missed six games. And not only did he miss six games, he missed the Creighton game, he missed two of the UConn games, right? And Marquette lost all of those games. I think they lost all of them by margin. And I don't think it's totally far-fetched, Joe, to think that like with Kolick, Marquette probably wins one of those games. And who knows what their power rating is if they win one or two of those. So I I just don't know that him being out for that stretch toward the end of the regular season and into the big East tournament is, is completely accounted for here in the number. So maybe you are getting a little bit of line value with Marquette uh, for that reason. Now I do think Marquette is far and away the more complete team here. You know, it's funny because this comes up every year, gets thrown around in February, then the tournament happens. And and it goes away, but pretty much every year, the winner of this tournament is top 30 in Ken Palm in both offensive and defensive efficiency. It, it Almost every year. Last year, we had all of the, the San Diego State, the FAU, you know, Miami coming into the, the mix. But who won? It was UConn, the team that was top 30 in both metrics virtually all season. Amazingly, there's actually nine of them still alive um, this mm. year. I can almost guarantee the winner will come from one of these nine. Uh, UConn, Houston, Purdue, Arizona, Duke, Tennessee, North Carolina, Creighton, and Marquette is that ninth one. And Marquette's been pretty consistent on both sides of the ball all year. Uh, Again, 19th offensive efficiency, 21st defensive efficiency. How much higher is that number right now, Joe, if Kolick doesn't miss six games? It's probably high. (laughs) As far as a matchup matchup standpoint is concerned, I think NC State could be in trouble here. Marquette can... They can press and they can fall back into the zone. So I played Oakland over the weekend uh, under the the uh, on the thought that I you know that I knew they were going to sit in a zone and I thought NC State would be forced into a number of tough shots because they they've been taking bad shots all season. It's been my my number one main knock on this NC State team. They they take horrible shots. They force a lot of really tough, difficult shots, and they did that against Oakland. Nine for twenty six from three. I mean. Really, with a little bit more execution there, Joe, we're probably talking about Marquette Oakland right now, not Marquette NC State. So I think that might be forgotten a little bit here. I mean, that was an overtime game. Oakland had a a chance to win it at the end. And Marquette's going to be much tougher in terms of like being able to drop into his own, but still go to their three quarter court press. Shaka, uh, Shaka Smart's been known for like the Havoc type press. So, you know, NC State, not the best ball handling team. Uh, you know, I, I could see them running into some issues there, uh, having to attack a Marquette zone or deal with Marquette pressure or probably both it is probably what NC State's going to be up against here. Um, you know, Marquette gets knocked for not being a very good rebounding team, but NC State's not necessarily the team that can take advantage of that. Like their rebounding numbers are better. But Joe, do you know why the rebounding numbers are probably better? Because they miss a lot of tough shots. OK, like mm-hmm. they're missing a lot of shots. so. They're getting some long rebounds because of that. So, like, that to me is not, like, a huge edge in their favor. You know, Marquette, I I don't think they're just going to get crushed on the boards here and lose a game like that. Um, One other thing, my uh, my buddy Christian, at ODJ Hoops on Twitter, uh, I'll do his stuff sometimes, very good follow, posted, like, a, a reel of DJ Burns just getting absolutely cooked on pick and roll and ball screens. And Oakland did almost none of that. Marquette will pick and roll all day long. Kolick is, again, as good of a, a, a point guard as you're going to find in the country. They're going to pick and roll him to death, and he's going to be in trouble trying to guard that. So I, I really like Marquette. I love them to advance uh, for what it's worth. I mean, I know that that's not like some 
crazy take here. They're mm-hmm. a six and a half point favorite. Uh, but I'll be looking. F- it, it, this is one I'm, I may get to the window with here, uh, especially if it were to like go to six or something like that. I, I'd have to jump in for sure. Uh, I, I do think Marquette finally puts NC State out of their misery and, and moves along here. Yeah, I'm seeing right now, and again, this one is uh, this is going to be on the 29th, and yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, NC, uh, currently, NC State on the Wager Dog Live odds page, uh, getting nearly 70 percent of the tickets. So uh, you got to think the public uh, just thinks this train is going to continue. Uh, we will see about that one for sure. Here, we do have a couple of other uh, questions coming in. I know uh, Seth. Wants to know whether or not the biggest problem in college basketball is prop betting. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so because apparently that's all the NCAA uh, thinks is is wrong right now with college sport. Not NIL money or paying kids a half a million dollars. No, no, prop betting is the is the issue here. I got it. Uh, Brian, we did get a great question from uh, Instagram here. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on North Carolina covering against uh, Bama. Uh, obviously, defense is a major worry. What are your thoughts here, and uh, what are we seeing here now? We're seeing uh, an updated uh, number of four and a half uh, for North Carolina, 173 and a half. And by the way, the top three highest totals in the history of March Madness are the three games this year that Alabama has been involved in. So what are you thinking uh, in this Bama and North Carolina matchup? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, just touching on a couple things. I, I, I agree. Uh, if Marquette, the line drops, I think that's, that's probably a good side there. And getting back to the hedging situation, we not, we now have live betting in these games. So, mm-hmm. uh, if you can't get a hedge number that you oh, like, wait till live betting. And, uh, that's a good way to get some money back on the other side if, uh, if you're looking to do that. But yeah, with the Alabama North Carolina game, I've got my power ratings have the Crimson Tide ranked 11th. Uh, it's a team, as you mentioned, likes to get out and run because of that they're able to get a lot of easy baskets. They've got an offensive effective field goal percentage of 56.3. That is really impressive, um, especially playing in a big power conference that they do. Um, you used to be able to see teams like a Gonzaga or some of the uh, other teams coming out of smaller conferences with those kind of numbers. To do that in the SEC, it, that's pretty impressive. Uh, North Carolina does rank slightly better in my my numbers at number nine, but with the differential of four and a half points for the two spots, I don't think is correlated. Uh, in fact, if you like Alabama, I, I believe it opened at four, and North Carolina being such a public team, it wouldn't surprise me if this line gets bet up again. Um, and uh, so we may be able to get even more on Alabama if you like that side. Um, but um, the points, I think, are going to come into play here. And granted, the Tar Heels have performed better than the Tide and Step Up games. And... Uh, that's one of the reasons why money is coming in on North Carolina. But uh, I really like the way we've got a little bit of value in this game at four and a half on an Alabama team who, as I said, ranked 11th and 9th, they're pretty close. Uh, Alabama performs just as well as the Tar Heels do on the offensive glass, which is really a major strength of North Carolina. And if you take a look at the games that they've played so far, North Carolina had easy games against Wagner. And what we can now say is a very overrated Michigan State team. We thought that all season long. They've been able to play very well when the tournament comes around. But this year, they just didn't have it. They were a lesser team. So I like the Tide to take this one to the wire, and any points are a bonus, in my opinion. Yeah, got it. Uh, it it's going to be uh, interesting, especially for those that might be holding uh, tickets here uh, this game with <laughs> North Carolina or Alabama uh, moving forward for sure here. And uh, yes, yeah, it was a great point, Brian. I thought that was fantastic too with, you know, we talk about hedging, but let's not forget live betting is a big opportunity too as well. Probably, you know, hedging a much better number during some of these yeah. games if you really want to get there. But I do believe the consensus is avoid it for now. Still got uh, a lot of basketball to go here. Uh, Trig, I know on Wager Talk uh, today, uh, you did a uh, a game breakdown on, uh, was it Norfolk State? Uh, we got a couple of games here tonight, right? You've got a, uh, a best bet on that side here that you like? Yeah, it's my uh, only client play for the day. Uh, I played Nor- uh, Norfolk State plus one and a half. Um, yeah, I just... 
think that like you talk about like sort of hidden line value, right. Or maybe something that the books can't totally factor in. Um, I, 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 I know for a fact that Tarleton state didn't really put much stock into this tournament. Um, you know, I, I had my friend Kyle come do the, uh, the WAC conference preview with me. Um, he's hmm. the play by play guy for Tarleton state. And he was just, honestly, like they wanted to go to the CBI. It didn't really happen. The CIT kind of, it became a little bit of a joke. Like they brought this tournament back, I think with the right intention, um, they wanted to have four, four team pods and, and do a 16 team tournament, uh, with the four schools then playing in like a final four type setup. Uh, it was the first time doing this tournament since 2019. And what they ran into was what a, you know, probably just kind of what college basketball is these days. Just a lot of people didn't really want to play anymore, whether it be for reasons like, you know, guys are transferring or just, they, they prefer to end the teams just now. A lot of them just prefer to end the season and go into the off season, start recruiting, trying to get ready for next year. So they man they only managed to get nine teams for this tournament. Uh, Four of them played at Tarleton. So that was the only team to like fill their pod, if you will. Norfolk State had no one show up at their venue. They got to go right to the semifinal. And so they've been chilling in Norfolk since the end of the, the regular season. Of course, the MEAC tournament is at the Norfolk Scope, like down the street from, mm. from where Norfolk State is. And they had to play one quote unquote semifinal game as a 10 point favorite against Alabama AM. And they're right in the final. Now, that could, you know, Purdue Fort Wayne had to go to Bowling Green, win a game there. Then they had to go down to Tarleton, Stevensville, Texas to, to play on Monday. Again, they win as a six point underdog. I'm still kicking myself for not playing them in that game because I had a feeling Tarleton didn't really, you know, care much about, about advancing or, you know, I feel like they just kind of went through the motions to get through the first two rounds against easier opponents. Uh, and they go out there and win. And, and then they have to turn around, get on a flight. They were literally on Purdue Fort Wayne's coach's Twitter. They're like sitting around at the Dallas Fort uh, Worth airport waiting for a flight to go to Norfolk. Like that's a lot of travel. And this is like, I think they're yep. on like eight, eight out of 10 or something. They've been, they've played eight of their last 10 games on the road dating back to the regular season. That's tough. Like that's, that's a lot of travel now. Could it bring them together? Yeah, of course a little bit, but you know, this is a Purdue Fort Wayne team that really relies on like efficient offense. Can, can, are you going to run super efficient offense 48 hours from af after having to play a road, a true road game and then get on a, a essentially a, a day worth of, of travel? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. Who knows? We'll see, I suppose. But I'm certainly willing to, uh, you know, kind of bet against it to find out. As far as Norfolk State is concerned, I have a feeling Robert Jones, who's been their coach for the last 11 years, he's been with the program since mm. 2007. I feel like he's probably going to take one of these jobs. I mean, he's done everything he, he could do at that school. In my opinion, he's taken them to the NCAA tournament twice. He was an assistant on that team that beat Missouri about a decade ago. Um, mm. he, he, I just don't, it, it's hard to believe he's going to turn down one of these jobs out there right now. That's probably going to pay significantly more. So I, I feel like this might be his last game. Maybe we don't know it yet, but I, I have a feeling maybe the players know it. The fans might know it. I know that they're they're sort of promoting like a like a you know Pack Eccles uh, Hall on Twitter, which is their home gym. Uh, they typically draw pretty well for a MEAC team. I, my guess is they get like four thousand, maybe five thousand tonight um, for a quote unquote championship game. And so it just feels like it's going to be a game that means quite a bit to Norfolk State. I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything to Fort Wayne. I'm sure they want to win a title as well. Uh, but again, mm. just a lot to ask for a team that's been on the road for like over a week and Norfolk state well rested. They're playing at home. They, I think Steve Merrill told me on a wager talk today, a stat he had available that they're, they're like 14 and zero, like maybe even against the spread at home this year. I know they have like an unreal sort of road run, um, you know, this season uh, might be 14 and zero straight up. I'll, I'll have to go double check that, but historically pretty good at home and they're a good rebounding team and Purdue Fort Wayne. One thing they don't do well uh, they will get crushed on the boards, um, you know, specifically mm. allowing offensive rebounds to other team and, and teams. And that might be sort of the path to victory here for Norfolk State. So I thought the wrong team was favored, and I did take uh, Norfolk State plus one and a half for a four percent play. Uh, you think a lot of uh, a lot of folks in the uh, chat rooms uh, are thinking, well, I mean, with Purdue Fort Wayne, right? Points, points and more points. 
Um, do, is are you thinking that this thing gets to be a crazy shootout trig, or do you think that uh, maybe less points here with Norfolk State uh, pulling it out? It's tough to tell. Like Norfolk State, certainly, like I mean, they're capable of scoring. I don't know if they like necessarily want to play a track meet, but at the same time. Like Fort Wayne, I I would be willing to bet. Like part of my bet hinges upon them not being super efficient offensively. So I don't know if mm. I want to also come on here and say, yeah, it's going to go over. I think that number again. I'm not great with totals. Just like I, I don't bet many of them. Mid 140 seems like it's probably correct. Like I, I don't know that. You know, I, I don't know that I have a real opinion there one way or the other. But I will say this: if Purdue Fort Wayne's just doing whatever they want offensively, I might be in trouble with Norfolk. So I'll be, be rooting for an uglier, lower scoring game. Cause I do think it favors that would favor the Spartans. Uh, we've got, uh, and Brian, we got the interesting, and I'm going to be interested to see, uh, uh, what both of you have to say about this. Cause there's a lot of conversation about a team that you both know and have seen pretty well. And that's UNLV, Brian Leonard here. You have spent many of shows here this year, Talking about UNLV, and if we're being honest, you were uh, you were for them. Uh, you had no problem picking against them. Are you shocked they're here? They got Seton Hall here tonight. Uh, the uh, the chat room seemed to be split here on whether or not it would be Seton Hall or UNLV. I mean, they're still cross country here, and the line has gone to six uh, for Seton Hall here. Are you shocked UNLV is at this point where you lean in one way or the other? Well, you know, he's actually played really well down the stretch. The only game mm. that they had lost was when they played San Diego State. And as we have seen the last two years from the Aztecs, they're a tough team to beat this time of the season. And they're certainly uh, this week is a 10-point underdog. There's got to be a lot of people that think they got a chance in that game. But, um yeah, the, Re the Rebels were in Jersey, had to fly back to Vegas. Now they got to fly back <laughs> to Jersey again. Uh, visiting Jersey one time in a year is enough for most people. Uh, but now they get to go back twice in a short amount of time. But uh, I I wanted to fade UNLV, and unfortunately I didn't give out the play early enough. And now all the money is coming in on Seton Hall, and it's gotten past my strike point. So, yes, I think Seton Hall is going to win. Yes, I think they're going to cover, but I'm not going to lay – two and a half points more than what I could have laid yesterday. And that's just good business sense when you're betting is for a living. So like Seton Hall, but uh, unless somebody comes in with a lot of money on the Rebels, it's out of my price range. They've been playing well. I know, Trig, that you saw them. And by the way, Trig, uh, very astute viewers uh, in the chat room here. Uh, I believe a few of them have noticed the shirt you're wearing. And want to know if it's a mm -hmm. sign from God, if that's the way you're leading <laughs> tonight. Uh, because for those that don't know, uh, Trig never shows up in a show without repping at least one school he has either seen or may, in fact, be betting uh, on the evening. So, uh, Trig, uh, your thoughts on UNLV? And uh, is it a sign uh, from the basketball gods? So... <laughs> Um, no, I kind of just threw this on today. I, I actually forgot that VCU was even playing tonight. I do. I guess I suppose I lean. I, I suppose I lean toward VCU if, if I absolutely had to in that game. I just I like the way they play. And, and I think, you know, you're asking quite a bit to I mean, what is it up to eight? That, that seems yeah. it, it feels yep. similar to like feels similar to like Ohio State, um, Georgia last night where the number just felt outrageous. I did think it was like set up for Ohio State to potentially win and cover, but then Georgia wins. I don't know. It's, it'd be hard. Like VCU plays so hard. They're so well coached. Like mm. I, I feel like they'll find a, maybe find a way to stay within eight, but certainly not something I'm super confident on. Um, Seton Hall, I got my win with them over the weekend. Uh, I laid four mm. against North Texas. Um, now, I think the numbers probably gotten a little out of control. You're you're talking like six is just it's a pretty big ask. But again, like they're playing this can they're they're playing this the, the tournament on campus. I believe I, I'm assuming this is still in in, in the campus gym, uh, Walsh Gymnasium. Yeah. I know that's where they played. I know that's where they played the last few games. Uh, definitely, and I said over the weekend, uh, Seton Hall was a client play for me. 
it's like reminiscent of what Sienna did when they won the CBI, where typically Sienna plays in the big downtown arena. They knew they probably wouldn't get many fans to, to come out for it. So they put it in their little on campus gym, like 3,000, um, yeah. you know, 3,000 capacity. And all the kids the showed YMCA, up. The YMCA, you know, uh, Like you can't even get a yeah, ticket. Yeah, exactly. Like it's. <laughs> well, well, this is actually, I, I believe, for Seton Hall. I think this is where they they maybe play volleyball and some women's games. Like it looks beautiful. Mm. It, this isn't just some bullshit gym. It's like it looks yep. gorgeous. They they definitely renovated this this facility and it's used for something else. So yeah, it's a great atmosphere. I thought I thought Seton Hall coming into this, like if they took it seriously, it would be a team right there at the end. So I think I still lean that way. Do I really want to lay six? Probably not, but I, I don't know if this is one where I'd come back and, and try to take the points. It'd probably be Seton Hall or pass for me here. Um, yeah, and then again, the other one, I suppose, VCU would be my my slight lean in the other NIT game. So we've got uh, we got uh, one more, uh, one or two more questions uh, coming in here. And Bri, tell the folks, though, because uh, little birdie told me there's uh, there's this little round ball, and they play with a bat, and it's a sport called. Uh, uh, baseball. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but that uh, is coming. I think soon there's uh, there's going to be some sort of activity uh, with that kind of situation there. And uh, if I understand correctly, you and Trig both uh, enjoy this uh, this ball and this bat thing here. Uh, what do you have uh, tonight, if anything? And what might we expect here with this very odd, strange activity people are about to do for a long time? Well. Uh, first pitch started up today. Tokyo Brandon and I were on there, and Adam R and I are on this today, and we'll be joined on first pitch tomorrow and talk about a full slate of games. Uh, the Padres and the uh, Dodgers played a couple games in Korea before all this excitement about Shoni Otani. But uh, yeah, it should be a really good uh, card. You've got a lot of aces going tomorrow, and uh, really excited. I uh, finished number three in Major League Baseball last year. I've had some number one finishes for the site over the years. So I love baseball. And as you mentioned earlier, I go to spring training every year. I usually spend two weeks in Arizona. only spent a, a few days in Florida this year. But, yeah, baseball is my specialty, one of my specialties, along with the hockey and the college basketball. So looking forward to a really good season. And in fact, the last two years, on plus money underdogs, we've really done very well. And what I consider a plus money underdog is any underdog at plus 101 or better. Um, when mm. you've got a juice line of minus, you know, minus 105 each way, the, or maybe a 106, 104, it would be, the one team would be an underdog. But I consider all the underdogs to be plus money underdogs, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, I've got three plays up in that regard on tomorrow's card, and we are, as a site, or for opening day, we're doing 50% off all mm. of our baseball packages for tomorrow. So you get Triggs baseball, you get mine, you get everybody on the site who does baseball. It's a good way to start the season, save some money. And I do want to point out, since we are talking college basketball, I do have a 5% play going. And I haven't had many. I think I've had, this is probably my third on the season in college basketball. Mm. A lot of success, number two in college basketball net profit on the season. So if you want to grab that, you can do that over at the site right now. I'm being told in the chat rooms that baseball starts in October. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I'll have to uh, look. I'll have to look into that there. But I think there's uh, a couple of guys here on this panel that uh, might agree. From now until October, you can certainly uh, make yourself extremely profitable with that sport here once everything else uh, goes away. But that is going to be fun, Trig. Uh, there is some concern here in the chat room that maybe uh, too much uh, too much public love for the Zags. Uh, are you thinking the Zags are for real here, or are we undervaluing Purdue? Uh, and numbers still sitting at five, five and a half here. It opened up at four and a half. Do uh, you, you have that feeling that maybe everyone's going to be looking for Matt Painter to do what he usually does this time of year, which is throw up all over himself, him and his team? Uh, or are we giving too much credit to, or not enough credit really, to Purdue here at this point? I, I don't buy like the whole, I, I get it. Like Purdue's had some early exits from this tournament. And of course, like none none worse than, than last year, losing to a 16 seed. 
But I think that's like <laughs> a, a kind of like a, a tired argument at this point. Like they've already, they've already silenced that, right? Like they, they blew out Utah state and they rolled to the sweet 16. So I don't like, that wouldn't be my, my handicap for this. Like, I, I think that they have just as much of a chance as, as any of these other good teams to win this thing. Uh, my concern would be Gonzaga making the adjustment from playing them earlier in the season in Maui and mm. sort of being able to, to game plan to, um, you know, so they, if they lose by 10 in Maui, of course, I think Gonzaga's kind of, you know, come a, a ways from that, kind of figured out how to play with a short rotation. Um, you know, Gonzaga shot six for 32 from three in that game, um, got banged, you know, got banged around on the glass. So it's like, my, my concern would be that Gonzaga has the ability to make the adjustments to make this a game. But that being said, I don't know if I want to go against this Purdue team. Uh, I still, mm. like, there's still something, Joe, you know, I can't shake the fact that Virginia, the year that they lost to UMBC as a 16 seed, came back the next year and won the thing. Uh, when amen. they kind of got a ton of criticism <laughs> for that. They come That's back a great the next point, year and win it. That's a like, great point. We're, we're going on two, we're going on a couple <laughs> years of this Purdue team being elite, or at least you know bordering on elite as far as like college basketball is concerned. Is this the year they kind of get it done and put it together? Like, I, I guess like I, I don't I personally don't I'm not high enough on Gonzaga. I don't think I'm I, I could get to the window with Gonzaga here. I'm just not high enough on them as a team. I haven't been all season. I do acknowledge the fact that I think that they've like figured out how to play with the group that they have. You got to remember, this is a team that thought they were going to have steel venters. Um, there was a, another guy that I think went back to Australia. Like they, they lost some depth pieces before the season had to learn how to basically play like a six, seven man rotation. So they've definitely improved. Their offense looks a lot better, um, looked a lot better, you know, in the first round. Uh, but I just don't think I'm going to go against Purdue. Not not yet. Uh, I think it'd be Purdue or nothing for me. Uh, but again, do you want to lay five and a half? Give but you give Mark Few a full week to prepare, a full Oof. week to to try to figure out how to adjust from the earlier season matchup. I don't know if I want to do that either. This is what I'm talking about. Not there's mm-hmm. not going to be many spots. Like you're not going to have a bet in every one of these games. At least you shouldn't. Some of these lines are, are pretty tight. I would say this is one of them. Right. Let me uh, let me ask you, because there's a debate going on in uh, one of the chat rooms here uh, and shout out to those of you joining us uh, via Instagram. Hit that subscribe button. Those of you guys on uh, YouTube uh, or X or uh, if you're watching on your mobile there uh, via YouTube shorts, we appreciate you guys. If you go ahead and uh, hit that subscribe button, become part of the Wager Talk TV family, hit that thumbs up. We would certainly appreciate it. Um, there's a question about who's the most underrated team left in the Sweet 16. I'm seeing a lot of uh, hate for Clemson. I'm seeing even more hate for NC State uh, here. And people want to know why nobody's talking about Creighton, which I think has got to be maybe the hardest game on the board here in the Sweet 16, just because it feels like a coin flip, and it just doesn't feel like there's going to be any value one way or the other. Which team is hitting the threes is going to win that game here. But who does your eye wonder to when you're looking at all of these names on the uh, on the Sweet 16? Is there a team that you think maybe just we're not giving them enough credit that they actually have a pretty good shot of winning more than one game here? Well, I just I just want to touch on the game that uh, for a second that Trick talked about, the sure. Gonzaga. When they played Purdue, that was a totally different team. I, halfway through the season – I don't think I was the only one thinking St. Mary's may be the class of this conference. And since then, St. Mary's has fallen off a cliff and, uh, and Gonzaga has been normal Gonzaga. Um, when I take a look at the teams, I think Iowa State has some value. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're a very good team. Obviously, Connecticut um, and Arizona, along with Purdue, are elite. Uh, if Creighton is hitting their shots, Creighton could beat anybody. But the problem you have is they are not always hitting their shots. And when, when you take a look at Tennessee, they've got a lot of talent too, but they have a coach that has somehow thrown in some clunkers over the years. 
Um, this could be the game in that regard. Uh, I think I think if that guy line gets up to three, Creighton's a live dog there. But um, I think Iowa State, if they can get by Illinois, that's a very good team. Obviously, they've got Connecticut coming up. But um, Iowa State is one of the lower seeds, or actually one of the higher seeds, that still has mm-hmm. a chance to win it all. I, I think uh, they're, they're a decent team. I think they've got some uh, some good value on their side. Trig, is there a team in here you think that maybe, uh, you know, you got it wrong, we all got it wrong, maybe the Bucks got it wrong? Is there an undervalued team here? A lot of people pointing to Clemson uh, and saying nobody's talking about them. I've also seen a bunch of comments now here about uh, does isn't Illinois still in the tournament? Uh, so, you know, but there's so much time on Purdue and, uh, and UConn, you know, and it should be here. Uh, even Marquette getting a whole lot of love. but. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, Illinois is still playing and, you know, so is Clemson. So I don't really think it matters what the hell they did in the ACC. They're playing their best basketball right now. Isn't that really what matters here, Trig? Yes and no. I mean, there are certain teams that I don't think can, uh, like, for example, like, NC State could play their best basketball. They're not winning a national championship. Like, they're just not. Okay? Mm. So, like, I really, I really believe that. I, I'm going to tell you who I think has no chance to win it. Um, I don't think Clemson, NC State, San Diego State, I don't Alabama. I'll even go as far as to say Alabama. I just don't like their uh, their defensive metrics. Um, I, I don't think those teams have have any chance to to win to win this thing. I truly believe that the winner is going to end up coming from that that upper echelon sort of Kempom rating like it does every year. And I read them oh, off right. earlier. UConn, Houston, Purdue, UConn, Houston, Purdue, Arizona, Duke, Tennessee, UNC, Creighton, Marquette. If the if if it's not one of those nine teams, I'll be so surprised. So, you know, like I think I think Brian said like initially I thought Illinois might be like a sneaky team, but their defense is, is a little bit concerning. I know Brian kind of kind of pointed out that he didn't really see UConn, or I'm sorry, he didn't really see Illinois like cutting the nets down. I I kind of agree based on based on that. Um it's probably gonna be one of those nine teams because that it, it happens every year. And, and we always try to yep. you know make a case for one of these teams playing out of their minds. Like Clemson's here because they got a good draw. Okay. Like Clemson had a nice matchup against New Mexico and then played a Baylor team that they matched up well against with, in my opinion. Um, so I, I don't know. Like I just, I know that's boring, and I know no one like wants that, and everyone wants a, you know, a Florida Atlantic in the Final Four or or, or something like, yeah. you know, like we had right. last year. But yeah, I'm just not seeing it. It kind of feels like a year where we're going to get like two absolute powerhouse matchups in the Final Four. I don't know if they're going to all be one seeds, but it feels like we're going to get like a UConn playing. You know, maybe in Arizona. I don't know. I got. I, I don't. Ha- oh, the brackets right here on the screen. I think. You know, a Houston or a Duke playing like a, a Tennessee. Like, I really right. feel like you're getting into the Final Four, and it's going to be like two like big time matchups, probably for the f- top five or six. You know, teams as far as the odds are concerned. That that's just kind of how I see it playing out from here on. So we had a uh, poll question up. We put uh, on whether or not. UConn will repeat as national champs, and uh, it's it's funny because it's split right down the middle. No, 53%. Yes, 46%. So it looks like there's an awful lot of people. It's kind of split. Like, either UConn's going to win it, or UConn, in all likelihood, is going to lose this game. But I, I think we saw this game. It feels like we just saw this game uh, somewhere along the line. And, oh, yeah, only it was a better version of San Diego State a year ago. Uh, and this... And that a kid team is better than the one that won it last year. So uh, I wouldn't put a lot of stock into that. But if it's going to not happen for UConn, uh, it's going to not happen against, I think, somebody better than San Diego State. All right, Brian told you what he's got up ready to roll here. Trig, what do you got ready to rock there uh, on uh, wagertalk.com this week? Yeah, so I also am excited about baseball starting tomorrow. 
excited for a chance to redeem myself. I had a terrible baseball season last year. I, I've I've won seven of the last 10. So I think I've been documenting my baseball picks now, whether it be here or on my own for the last 10 years. Uh, last year was by far my worst. It was one of three losing seasons I've had in the last decade, uh, but far and away the worst. Um, 2020 and 2022 were both huge years. So maybe I'm like the San Francisco Giants and I can only win on the even years. And then I just suck and miss the playoffs on the other years. We'll see. Uh, but maybe that means I'm due for a good season. At the very least, I can't wait for it to start. Uh, Andrew McInnes and I are going to try a little live stream thing that we do every you know time there's like day games going on where you know it's kind of informal and we just like live stream and watch the game and, and hopefully you'll come hang out and do that with us. Uh, we're going to try to do that tomorrow. So looking forward to that. Uh, I will have a couple of plays. Uh, they'll either be part of the promo or I'll probably I'm on first pitch tomorrow so I will most likely give one for free actually you know what I'll definitely give at least one for free because I do have a five percent college basketball play in one of these sweet 16 games that is a Thursday game so uh I'll I'll definitely have a, a client MLB play out for free probably probably put it out on the first pitch show tomorrow Oh, see, there you go. A lot going on uh, across the board here uh, as Major League Baseball season will be back. And again, if you miss Triggs' uh, play and breakdown on uh, on Norfolk State, he gave it out on Wager Talk today. Of course, that is available right now on our YouTube page at Wager Talk TV. And don't forget, uh, hit that thumbs up, hit that like button if you could. We certainly appreciate it. Become part of the Wager Talk TV family and uh, go ahead, hit that subscribe button here. You'll find uh, you'll find nothing uh, but uh, daily and weekly content on all the big games, all the big sports. Uh, a lot of uh, Q and A, a lot of opportunities to get any questions you have answered here at Wager Talk, and we certainly do appreciate it. Don't forget the NBA afternoon update coming up in one hour from now. Make sure you stop by. See us there. We'll get you caught up with everything uh, that's going on in the NBA. Here is a loaded slate, a lot of line movement, a lot of injuries. Shocker, uh, but we'll get you covered. On behalf of Brian Leonard, uh, 5% best bet locked loaded and trig. 5% best bet locked loaded. You get the hint. Uh, head over to wagertalk.com, visit them, and then make plans to come back and join us again tomorrow for another live edition of the College Basketball Tip-Off Show. Until then, Best of luck with your plays here today. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good luck. Mm-hmm.